been trying to share with you that the only way to properly understand the Bible is to try to understand the original inspired author's intent. This intent is expressed in different ways. In the Gospel of John, it's, in, it's, it's, it's given in two ways that I think are very easy to understand. Number one are several interviews. And in these interviews, people talk about Jesus and to Jesus. And things are said that tell us about God, about Jesus, about us, God's will for our life. They're powerful. But you know, as you do a commentary on John, they almost get repetitious because the scene changes, the person changes, but the theology of human need, of the love of God, of the central place of Christ, of man's need to respond by faith. These are cyclical truths that just continue over and over in John. Also, John, writing as the last gospel writer, possibly 50 years later than the other ones, tries to fill in some of the gaps that the other ones left out or addresses some of the church needs, the heresies that are developing. So John gives us more information, sometimes different information, and he puts things together in ways that are meant to spark us to think. Last week, I preached on Nicodemus in John 3. I, I characterized him as Mr. Religious. Now, friends, the hardest person to ever witness to is a moral, good, religious person. I mean, there is just no harder person to recognize their need, not need for a morality that centers in what they do or don't do, but a need for a morality that centers in a personal relationship with the one who died in our place. It is crucial that this personal relationship be established in the lives of people. Nicodemus is one bookend. The other bookend is chapter 4. Mrs. Irreligious, the woman at the well. Now this is textual design. This is not chronology, this is theology. Somewhere between Nicodemus and the woman at the well, you are. All human beings are. This is a way of saying, when it says, for God so loved the world, it it, it included wealthy, religious, self-righteous people, and obviously continuing sinful people. And that's what we're meant to get. Now, I want you to follow me in your Bibles today. Please keep them open. Uh, Please follow with me. I want you to make sure that I'm saying what this book says. Maybe the best transition from chapter 3 to chapter 4 is what I've called this continuing vertical dualism. Now, that's just a big name for Jesus says, I know God because I've been with God. I'm from above. You're from below. You can't receive my message unless God lets you receive it. You can't come to me unless God draws you. This is this continuing theme. And it's the theme of Jesus' words. Jesus would say, I don't give you my words. I don't give you my teachings. I only speak what I've heard from the Father. Now, I want to begin at the end of chapter 3 to set the stage for chapter 4. I want to begin reading in verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. And he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he bears witness. No man receives his witness. He who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. And he who believes in the Son has eternal life. But he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Now Jesus is claiming unique authority. He is claiming the authority to represent the one true, invisible, creator, redeemer God. Jesus, this peasant carpenter without theological training from an area that everybody said was somewhat inferior, not quite kosher, was Galilee. And here came one who said to Jews, who knew their Bibles, 
I am revealing the Father. Now, just calling God Father is pretty shocking. But to say you speak for him. Now, this, uh, Jesus is a lunatic, a liar, or the son of God. Now, you've got to decide. I mean, that's, that's the basic options here. Now, let's pick up as the next bookend, Mr. Religion in 3, Mrs. Irreligion in 4. It starts out with a simple historical thing about a problem with the Pharisees. This has been the problem throughout because they're the religious, conservative, popular group of religionists in Jesus' day. And they are noticing that Jesus is baptizing more than John. Now, they'd had a conflict with John. John is, is baptizing some of them, but Jesus is baptizing more. Now, you might know that it says that Jesus wasn't baptizing, if you know John 4. But if you look back at chapter 3, 22, he was earlier. But no, knowing humans, I get people all the time that said, yes, so-and-so baptized me. So? Do you think it's some big deal to be that somebody baptized you? What happens if the person who baptized you gets saved later in life? We've got to read, don't you? The key is the heart of the candidate, not the worthiness or, or unworthiness of the one that performs it. Amen? I was baptized by Jesus. It's kind of like my mother's bigger than your mother. I mean, get over it. God knew. What, God knows us well. Jesus quit baptizing. So Jesus left and went back to Galilee. And think of a map of Palestine. Judea is down below. You've got Samaria in between right along the coast. And then you've got the area of Galilee around the Sea of Galilee. Most righteous, <laughs> self-righteous, Judeans would cross over across the Jordan and go up the Transjordan so they wouldn't set foot in the hated Samaritan territory. They couldn't buy lunch there because these people are unclean. I mean, the Jews said Samaritans were only created by God to keep the fires of hell burning. That's a great purpose in life. If you saw a Samaritan having a baby, you could not help that person have that baby. You could not offer a cup of water to a Samaritan out of the same cup that you drank out of. Do you hear the racism of this context? If you miss the racism of the good Samaritan parable and the racism of this chapter, you don't understand how you should interpret the Bible. Is there any group of people you don't like? Is there some pigment you don't like? Some educational level you don't like. Some cultural things or whatever. Is there some people you really don't like? That's who this is. That's who this is. The Bible says, and there's a real key, a little, a little Greek word here called dia, which is usually interpreted necessity, almost a moral necessity. He had to go through Samaritan. If I would put it in modern terms, there was a divine appointment somewhere close now, the Bible calls it, it uh, uh, Shinar, but many of us think it's Shechem because the place will be known in the Old Testament where uh, Jacob bought some land is close to Shechem, close to Mount Gerizim, the very mountain that the, the Samaritans built their temple on later. Uh, this is an issue about the most hated people in the world are going to be lovingly received by Jesus. Now, think about that. Okay, so he's going to this well. A sidecar is the name we call it. Many of us think it's probably Shechem. And it's the sixth hour. Now, John, you just wish people were consistent. <laughs> we, John seems to fluctuate between Roman time that starts at 12 noon and Jewish time that starts at 6 a.m. From Genesis, Jews begin their morning when the sun changes. And the evening and morning was day one. So... If it's Jewish time, it's noon. If it's Roman time, it's 6 p.m. Now, if, if you had to go and carry water, now water is heavy, but you had to carry it for your family every day, usually the women, for safety reasons, for fellowship reasons, all went together early in the morning to get water for the family. Would you want to carry water at the hottest part of the day? This lady went to the well when she knew nobody would be there. Because this is a social outcast. This is not just a member of an outcast group. This is an outcast of the outcast group. I mean, I don't know. And she's a woman. Now, in the ancient world, you don't get any lower than that. Thank God you're a woman in a Christian church today and not in a first century Jewish church or a mosque. 
I guarantee you, we take women's uh, freedom for granted. The person who made women free is not the now movement, but Jesus of Nazareth. Same thing's true of children. Ancient world didn't think of children the way we do. Jesus is the one that cared for children. And he's going to care for this lady that probably nobody else in town gave a second thought to, a second nod to, a greeting to. Here's, an, here's a, a total outcast coming by herself to get water. And there's a man sitting on the well. And it's a Jew too. And he asked her for a drink. And she's appalled. How do you, a Jew, ask me, a woman of Samaria, for a drink? First of all, you shouldn't be talking to me publicly because I'm a Samaritan. Second, you shouldn't be talking to me because I'm a woman. I mean, she's shocked. And knowing Jews, they can't drink out of the same cup from Leviticus 15 as a Samaritan. Now, you know the story. I don't have time to do it. The northern ten tribes were taken captive by Assyria. Samaria, the capital, fell in 722. They were All those Jewish tribes in the north were deported to Media. The Assyrians put other people back in their homes. They intermarried with the Jews that were left in the land. And that became the Samaritans who built their temple on the twin peaks of Ebal and Gerizim between the city of Shechem. And uh, there are still people who worship there today. There's still a Samaritan, Samaritan Pentateuch. So here is Jesus. Here's this outcast woman. Jesus asked her for a drink. And, and she's shocked. And, you know, she's, you know, always disciples and everybody who talks to Jesus thinks in concrete terms. I get so tickled, you know, at um, John 11. Um, Lazarus is sick. Uh, Lazarus is asleep. And the, and the disciples say, well, well, he'll wake up. And Jesus said, he's dead. Boys, he's dead. He's not. On and on, this physical level is community. Nicodemus, I can't be born again. I'm too big. Oh, my soul. And this woman is, you have nothing to pull the water up with. You ain't got no bucket. You ain't got no rope. She's on this surface level, and Jesus is about to jump to this other level. It's a play. Because the word well here is not the word for spring. This is not a spring-fed water container. This is a cistern a dug-out water container that only receives rainwater. So he's going to play on what they would call dead water versus a spring-fed living water. He's going to play on that to get her mind, to catch her mind. In verse 10, is a really unusual Greek construction. It's not used a whole lot, but it's used by Jesus mostly in the Gospels. It's called a second-class conditional sentence. A false statement is going to be made to highlight a false conclusion. So notice in verse 10, it should run something like that. Jesus is talking to her and he says, If you knew the gift of God, which you do not, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would ask him, which you don't, and he would give you living water. It, at, she doesn't know who it is. That's obvious. She, she doesn't recognize who it is. Verse 11, she says to him, Sir, now this is the word Curios in its vocative form, curi, that simply, sometimes it means sir, mister, and other times, like Romans 10, 13, whosoever shall call upon the Lord. Now, that's a theological hair pull. That is a, that is a word used to describe deity. That's how the Jews uh, printed in their text, how they pronounced the covenant name for God, Yahweh, Lord, Adon. So this word, it depends on the context how we first use this word. She's just saying, sir, mister, hey, you, <laughs> um, you have nothing to draw up. The well's deep. How can you get this living water? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? <laughs> you got to read with an analytical mind. Why do you think they bring that question in? You're not greater than our father Jacob. Absolutely he is. That's the whole point. Why do you think in chapter 8 of John, about verse 53, when these Jews that believed in him said, you're not greater than our father Abraham, are you? And Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. That's exactly what he's saying to them. I am spiritually superior to the patriarchs of Israel. That's exactly what he's saying. It would have shocked a Jew. It's going to shock this Samaritan woman. Now, notice. Jesus answered, verse 13, and said to her, Everyone, I love everyone. I love everyone just like, like I love, in verse 42, the Savior of the world. 
Just like I love John 3, 16, whosoever. Just like I love John 1, 12, whosoever. It's going to include a self-righteous, snobby Nicodemus. And it's going to include this wretch of a woman. Now, somewhere between those two you fit. I don't care who you are. The pompous, arrogant one or the terribly needy one. I want you to know God loves you with the full force of his love. Has nothing to do with your worth. Has everything to do with his character. That's the message we've been singing about. That's why we call him Father. You love just the good kids? Pray for just the good kids? Or do you love that prodigal just as much? Love that wayward one just as much. This is the love of God spread abroad in the world. Now, let me continue. Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water I shall give him shall become to him a well. There's that spring of what almost reminds you of John 7, doesn't it? 38, about that well of water that gushes up in their bosom to eternal life. That's that same concept. It goes back to the Old Testament, particularly the servant songs of Isaiah. I was thinking of 49.10, where this idea of water on a parched land, eternal water, a living water, is it's just a promise of the blessings of God for, for, a, for a believing people. Shall spring up to eternal life. Remember, I told you only John talks about eternal life. Now, this is the word zoe in John, which means God's kind of life. New age life. This is not quantity of earthly life. This is quality of heaven life. This is the relationship of the Garden of Eden before the fall. This is the intimacy of Jesus and the Father in uh, John 17. Eternal life. The woman said, give me this water. I don't have to come out here anymore. It's a long way. It's heavy water. <laughs> give it to me. I'll take it. Now look what Jesus said. And again, he, he's going to prick this woman's conscience about her need. Go tell your husband. And she says, well, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right. You don't. You had five, the one you're living with is not a husband. Now, boy, this woman knows this. She's not talking to a Jew sitting by a well anymore. Jesus is starting to move her to a new understanding of this living water. And the first point of the good news is the bad news of human rebellion. Now, Jesus does not condone her sin, but neither is he offended by it. It's almost like he knew the Father wanted him to meet a person like this, all alone at a well. Why? To say to all the world, I don't know who you are and what you've done. I don't know how ostracized you are from polite society. But I want you to know your maker loves you and wants to know you. It's always amazing to me that God wants us to be a part of his family. Is that just grown too weary for you to grab the emphasis of that kind of character. So um, he, she admits this, and she said, she's trying to, if you do much witnessing, we call this a theological red herring. She's going to try to change the subject on him. <laughs> it's, almost, it's almost what Nicodemus did. Well, he did it too, really. But, oh, what about this? <laughs> get off the subject. Try to compliment him and then get off the subject. I perceive that you're a prophet. No kidding. <laughs> Some would say this is the Deuteronomy 18 messianic prophet. Ah, this may be a little early for her to think this is the Messiah, but not in a few more verses she won't. She's going to admit this open mouth. It's just a few more. So she says, now, you know, we got this theological fight. We got this one group meets on that mountain, and we meet on this mountain, and we both think God only meets on our mountain. Now, Jesus says, well... Salvation comes from the Jews. Now, this is talking about this messianic promises of the Old Testament. But it's going to say, this is shocking. I tried the other, other day when I was, was doing in, in John with you say, I don't think you realize how the cleansing of the temple in chapter 2 was the, such a radical statement. It really was the death sentence of Jesus. When he said the great hope of the Jewish nation is not effective, I am the only effective one. He is going to reject Judaism on Mount Moriah and he's going to reject Samaritan worship on Mount Gerizim 
And he's going to say the day is coming and now is. When if you want to know God, you got to know me. And it doesn't matter where you worship, in a big building, in a clay hut, in a grass roof, under a big tree. It's not the accoutrements of worship. It's not the merit of the worshipers. It's not the liturgy of the worshipers. It's the object of the worshipers. And if the object is anything but the crucified, resurrected Jesus Christ, you ain't going to make either mountain. It's shocking to us. It offends us. It's a radicalizing of human religions that makes all of our attempts to reach God futile. And yet the God of the Bible reaches down to us in the midst of our religion confusion and draws us to himself. So we're into this mountain question about verse 20 and 21. Now, my New American Standard says, woman. Well, it, that's a little harsh. It probably should be madam, something like that. Believe me, an hour is coming when neither this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Now, you, I just don't think you know how radical a statement that is. Everything those Jews were trusting in was connected to that temple. Jesus washed it away. When, when he, on Matthew 24 and Mark 13, Luke 21, when he said, tear down this building, three days I'll build it again. The Jews were ready to kill him for that. Because their great hope was in that mosaic structure, that sacrificial system, that place of ritual and liturgy. And Jesus wipes it away. Uh, you worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. That's, that's Romans 9, first few chapters deal. But the hour is coming and now is. Do you catch what that's saying? The hour is coming and now is. I, the two comings of Christ have caused some theological tension in Scripture. The Jews expected one coming where, where the Messiah comes as a, as a judge, empowered Military judge, defeat the enemy, set Israel up. But the problem is that there were two comings. That the Isaiah 53, the Zechariah 9, they missed this first coming of a servant, of a savior. Now they were right about a second coming in power and for judgment. And so the truth is that I believe the kingdom has been inaugurated in the life of Christ. But it has not been consummated. The time is coming and now is. Shocking. When true worshipers shall worship the Father. Now, we don't often talk about the Father, especially, notice he's mentioned in 21 and 23. Usually the only time we use the word Father in the New Testament is when we say the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we use the word. It's very rare. And I, I don't even know if it's how many times it is to use the Father by itself. This is a new concept of God. He's not the hanging judge of the universe. He's not the tribal leader. I, I didn't understand God at all until I started having children. I grew up in a divorced home, didn't have a father. And suddenly I have children and now these powerful human emotions are flowing in me of love and desire for their best. And yet I have to experience their rebellion and misunderstanding and all the rest that comes with raising children. Something I, I know now about God. Notice the rest of verse 23. The father... We must show worship the Father in spirit and truth. In spirit and in truth. Now, I think we're trying to say it doesn't matter what physical place we're talking about. And we can't do it in, in human religiosity or human systems. It's got to be in revelation. Uh, it, it becomes something more than a building. God help us. The church is not a building. The church is a people. The church does not meet twice or three or four times a week. The church is on call 24-7 throughout the world. Spirit and truth. For such a people the Father seeks. Now that, that, that grabbed me. I want you to look at two texts later today. Would you write them down, please? Bring a pencil. There's no test. <laughs> Yet. Chapter 6, verse 44. Chapter 15, verse 16. I, I am... A, God didn't come to a worthy person like Nicodemus and say, no me. He came to this Samaritan village prostitute. This total outcast. This, this total person who'd be rejected by their own society. In the midst of obvious sin to everybody. Jesus met this woman. And friend, he'll meet you. God seeking 
us? Does that, has that lost its power? No one comes to the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. Ah, oh, what a powerful text. And I believe he draws every person. The mystery is why some say no. Verse 24, God is spirit. Now, we, earlier, when I read in chapter 3, God is true. We can go to other texts. God is love. God is light. These are very simple statements in John. John writes simple truth. But, oh, who can plummet the depth of these? Who can plummet the depth? God is spirit. Uh, he is not a physical being. He's not a male. He's not a female. He's not present here. He's throughout the universe, throughout the cosmos, throughout the creation. And we who worship must. There's that word D again. He must go through Sychar. He must worship him in spirit and in truth. And the woman said, well, I know that the Messiah is coming. She, she knew the Samaritan Pentateuch. She knew the promises that he who is called the Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Look at verse 26. And you tell me Jesus never claimed to be God. Now, follow me with this. Please keep, keep your Bibles open here. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am. Now, do you have a, a Bible that has italics? Would you notice that the word he is in italics? This does not say I am he. No, no, no. This says, woman, I am. Now, friends, that is the covenant name for God from Exodus chapter 3. Moses said, who shall I say sent me? And God says, say, I am that I am sent you. This is that title for deity. Uh, now, this is not the I am statements of John. I am the resurrection, the life. Now, this is not those I am statements that are so famous. This is a unique set of places where Jesus unambiguously says, I am. I'm going to give them to you real quick. I hope you'll write these down. I think you'll enjoy this. 824, 828, 858, just a couple more, don't get tired, 1319, and 18.5. Now, I think it goes back to the servant songs of Isaiah, where this very phrase is used in Isaiah 41.4, 43.10, and 46.4. What is Jesus saying? Sister, I'm the Messiah. And he's doing it in terms that to a Jew or a Samaritan, knowing the Pentateuch would reflect deity. Uh, Jesus is not, he is not veiling this. These, there's no parables here. There's no language that can, this is unambiguous, straightforward. This lady gets it. This lady gets it. Notice how it continues. At this point, the disciples come back. The lady is so awed. She runs off when the disciples come back. And look at verse 28. And she left her water pot. Now you talk about an eyewitness detail that confirms this is true. Uh, history. That's it right there. She left her water pot. She came to get water. She got the water, but it wasn't the one that went in that pot. And she ran back to town to tell those people. And she's going to say, I met someone that knows everything I've done. And they went, yeah, we do too. But that impressed them. So they wanted to come talk to this guy. So notice, the disciples say, aren't you hungry, Jesus? Jesus, they wanted to say, are you talking to a Samaritan woman? But they didn't. They were afraid to ask because they'd know they'd get slapped. So they just kept it to themselves. And then they said, well, Jesus, you're not hungry. Why don't you eat? Jesus said, I've got food that you know not of. Look at verse 34. I thought to myself, what does it mean to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work? I got three texts that I want to mention to you that I think may fit here. The first one that comes to my mind is Mark 10, 45. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. Or Luke 19.10, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you want to look at John 6.29, what is the will of the Father? That we believe on him who he has sent. Jesus had something to do. And that was to help people know the Father, know and understand who he was as the Father's official promised representative, and trust solely and completely in Jesus and Jesus alone. Now, just a few more points here. In verse 39, Jesus is talking to the disciples. I, I love this text. And he says, you know, you think it's going to be harvested in four months. And just at that moment, in my mind, I can see over that, over that hill came that whole town. Because one, 
What adulterous woman said, I met the Messiah. The town is hungry. This is Samaritans, hated by the Jews. But just one little flicker of hope. And here comes the town over the hill. And they come to Jesus, the Jew, and he stays two days with them. Doesn't that show you that the love of God is not focused in Jerusalem alone? We got all these Syrophoenician women, all these extra people in different parts. And the whole point of including that story is to say he really is the Savior of the world. In verse 29, I want to pick up just a thought here. From the city, many Samaritans believed in him. Now, in John, there's a preposition in that means just what it does in English, believe in him. There are a preposition, hadi, that believe that, and then we're going to have a statement, believe that he is the Son of God, believe that he raised the dead. There's content in that word, hati, believe this about him. But most of John, it's the preposition ice that means believe into. We could almost translate it rely on. Now remember the word believe means faith, trust, or believe. It's translated the same way. So they believe in Jesus by the woman's testimony. This week I had a, a person that's a good friend of me, uh, of mine in Marshall, uh, mentioned about his son, married son, who is now struggling with the things he was taught as a child. And it's uh, so distressing to the parents. The, the son has uh, experienced some tragedy in a friend's life and is now questioning the goodness of God and the love of God and the uh, reality of God. And the parents are just, just, they're just distressed. And I, I wrote back to him and said to him, you know, uh, as a university professor at a Christian university, kids would come all the time and they would have the right answers and they would know what I would consider evangelical theology and then a boyfriend would drop them or they break their leg in football or they can't finish this. Tragedy comes and suddenly, or they just start maturing and suddenly they start questioning everything they've been told. They start, they start wondering about, is this true? My parents gave it to me, people I trust, but is this true? The reality of life and the world sets in. And somehow in the four years at a Christian universe, these young people get their, get, they just get their guts ripped out because faith cannot be given by another. We give our children the best knowledge we have, the best understanding we have, the, the, the unfor, the, uh, just limitless love. But there's got to come a time where they begin to trust Him and not us. There's got to come a time to the crisis, the crucible of the pain of this fallen world where they've got to decide, is this, this really who God is? Is this really who Jesus is? Is, is this really what life is about? And it is painful. So these, these, these villagers, after Jesus staying two days, look at verse 42. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. They came because of her witness, but they found their own faith. Now everyone in this room, that has to happen. No grandchildren in the kingdom of God. I did a survey at my church. I used to not let people join my church unless they shared their testimony with me. And I, I was real close to Texas Tech, something like three blocks, had literally hundreds of Texas Tech kids come every Sunday. If they wanted to join, they had to give their testimony. And they would tell me things. You know, Bob, I trusted Christ at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, vast majority, 80% plus, 7 through 12. And they said, Bob, I really didn't get serious until the marriage had a problem. The first child had a problem. Lost my job. I got a report back from the doctor. Um, uh, on and on. Some crisis came in their life. Usually six, eight, ten years after they'd become a Christian. And it really, really, really wasn't theirs until the crucible of crisis. And they'd say, I got, I got real. It got real to me. It got serious to me. I, I began to come not because I was told it was right, but because I know I need it. The, 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 the personal relationship. You know, we say we're against infant baptism. But the last, statistic, the last statistic I saw in Southern Baptist life, that is in the Southern Baptist Convention in one year, 20,000 five-year-olds were baptized. Pastors keep score by how many. Now, we're not far from infant baptism when 20,000 five-year-olds come. There may be one here or there old enough to do it. 
But I'm telling you what's happening in the, in the life of church kids is they hear the truth, they sing the songs, they come to church, and the statistic now is, God have mercy on us, the statistic now is of couples who are active in church, 85% of their children do not attend once they leave home. 85%. Somehow, we've got to force the crisis of faith. It's painful. But until faith becomes yours, until it becomes personal, until you're ready yourself to take on the pressures, it's just hearsay. Let me ask you, do you have hearsay faith or do you have personal faith? Let me ask you, I asked last week, I knew he was here. Mr. Nicodemus, you're here, you self-righteous, judgmental person, you. Now I want to ask today. Sinner, terrible, godless, ostracized, broken, crushed, hopeless person, are you here? Same God that loved Nicodemus, the same God that loved you, and whosoever will may come.